On today's show, a mini mailbag of sorts here in late September. We cover the gamut of things going on with the Hawks in training camp, as well as some bonus audio at the end of the podcast. We'll have all that and more coming up. You are Locked On Hawks, your daily Atlanta Hawks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day. Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 1315 of the Lots on Hawks podcast. I am your host, Brad Roland, coming to you on a Monday evening into Tuesday. And thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today, making us your first listen each and every day. Check us out across platforms. That includes Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher. And on the video side, we are on YouTube as well. And by the way, our moniker at the Lots on Podcast Network is your team every day. And we're going to that format even more so now, four or five times per week. We'll be here on this podcast talking about the Hawks and the Eastern Conference and the whole landscape of the NBA for the most part. And uh, today's show is sort of a mini mailbag of sorts. Not a whole lot going on. In fact, the Hawks had a team retreat on this Monday instead of practicing. And they're also off to the media on Tuesday before they have a two-day practice on Wednesday that includes the open practice down at State Farm Arena. I'll be in the building for that one. That's, of course, the fan invite event down at the arena, more of a spectacle than anything else. So in between training camp stuff, Today's show is a mailbag of sorts, and we'll also have some uh, some final media day video and audio at the end of the podcast from John Collins I'll share as well. So we'll dive right in, as we always do, but thank you for the questions, as always. And I keep them coming, by the way. If you want to send a question in, we can be found at Locked on, Locked on Hawks on Twitter. Also, you can send them to LockedOnHawks at gmail.com if they're a little bit longer form, and that's a better format for you. So first question comes from Stephen, who says, can you talk a little bit more about Jay Crowder as a trade option? It seems like he would help the Hawks. So I briefly discussed Crowder on Monday's show, and I recorded that podcast on Sunday afternoon before a word actually broke about Crowder and the Suns mutually agreeing that he actually would miss training camp while they are looking to try to find a trade partner for him. Uh, it was sort of out there for a while that Crowder was at least on the trade block, but now it's like very much official as he's not going to be going to training camp. He'll, be, he'll probably, be, probably be traded by the Suns in the near future. So a little bit more on this, obviously, when Stephen was not the only one to ask me about Jay Crowder. At this stage, my very broad stance that I kind of shared on that last show on Sunday night into Monday was that Crowder is still a very useful player. He would help the Hawks in a vacuum. But what I said on that show also still stands in that it would not be the easiest trade in the world to put together because of the real world logistics involved with contracts and assets and all that fun stuff. So first, there is a salary cap component of this. Crowder is making about $10.2 million this year on an expiring contract. That's not a huge, like, prohibitive price tag, but it's definitely some real money for a team like the Hawks that's not trying to go into the luxury tax this year. Um, the Hawks don't really have anybody in that exact range to trade other than DeAndre Hunter, who they would not trade for. Crowder, I'm pretty confident in that. So the closest thing to kind of build a package around for Jay Crowder if they wanted to do that would be Justin Holiday. He's making about $6.3 million on an expiring contract, so about $4 million less than Crowder. Pretty ironically, they could trade the same package of Justin Holiday and Mo Harkless that they actually received in the deal for Kevin Herter. That actually would, would make the money work um, for for Crowder. But for the Suns, they wouldn't have any reason to do that. Uh, I'm sure they probably value Crowder at a higher level than those guys. And I'm not sure the Hawks want to throw anything up, uh, sort of a draft pick or anything like that alongside. If it wasn't Harkless, you know, they could do Holiday and Jalen Johnson from a money perspective. But I don't think Hawks fans would be overjoyed about trading Jalen Johnson and deal for Jay Crowder on an expiring contract. Neither would I. It's not a deal that I would be doing if I was the Hawks. And also, you know, a wing plus that. Justin Holiday is a pretty valuable player as well. So there's not a super clean fit money-wise that I can see between the Hawks and the Suns. Obviously, if it was a bigger deal, like involving, you know, other pieces maybe. But if it's just for Crowder, it's not the easiest thing to, in the world to find. And basketball-wise, Crowder would, again, help the Hawks. He's a pretty good, rugged defender. He knows what to do defensively. He's also a pretty willing shooter. Not a great shooter necessarily, but he will, he will bomb it away, which can be helpful on offense. He had a great shooting season two years ago. Last year, not not as much. He's a career guy, like mid-30s guy from three. It's more like what I would trust than two years ago's breakout from three. And also, Crowder is more of a four at this point. In fact, he's like mostly a four. I mean, he played three early in his career. He's uh, definitely you know small forward size, but mobility has been lost for him in the last couple of seasons. And I think that he is more of a four than a three at this stage. So really, the Hawks would have to be really prioritizing a present-day upgrade at the four to go after Jay Crowder over Jalen Johnson and whoever else they will be actively using in that spot. So I could go super long on this, but I won't. Um, Crowder is a local product from Villarica. 
and obviously is still a very useful player. But I'll be pretty surprised if the Hawks are the team that actually ends up trading for him. It wouldn't be you know completely stunning because again he would help them. He's a very solid player. But uh, in terms of like the current evaluations of the Hawks roster, Crowder being on an expiring, taking on money because the Hawks again I, I believe the Hawks do not want to go into the tax and uh, taking on any money for Crowder would be sort of a problem as well. And honest, honestly, I'm sure they want to see Jalen Johnson at some point. So all those factors in play, I would guess probably not on Crowder, but we'll see in the coming days. Um, all right. Next question comes from Darren who says, what is the status of the Andre Hunter's extension uh, after the, what you were talking about on the podcast and what are the deadlines? So as I record, this is the evening of Monday, September 26th. And the most recent stuff with Hunter's extension is at Landry field set at media day, but the two sides are talking still at this point in time and they like to get something done. That's kind of what the team would always say. So I'm not really sure that means a whole lot. At this stage, Hunter kind of dodged the questions at Media Day about you know, his agents kind of handling the talks, but I asked him about that. And also he got a question from Jeff Schultz about where he thought it was going to get done, and he said basically just nothing about that answer. So as far as the deadline a part of the question, Hunter and the Hawks have until October 17th to agree on an extension. That is two days before the season actually starts for Atlanta on the 19th of October. If they were to find a deal, uh, by the way, it would not start until next season. So Hunter's salary this year – $9.8 million is locked in for this year. That's not going to change. People were kind of confused by this last year with Kevin Herter. When, when Herter signed the extension, it didn't begin until now. And obviously he was already traded before it actually started for the Hawks. But regardless, Hunter's deal for this year is locked in. $9.8 million expiring. Um, if they do not agree on an extension, Hunter will become a free agent at the end of this season. He will very likely be a restricted free agent as well if the Hawks do not extend him now. And basically the Hawks would just have to just generate him a qualifying offer at the end of this season to make him restricted. That would probably be a no-brainer unless something goes very wrong between now and then. And from there, Hunter would have a very, very large salary cap hold, almost $30 million actually, because he's a former top five pick. It's sort of scaled up for that. So keep that in mind as well. That number would stay on the books until the Hawks actually brought him back or actually he left in some form or fashion. So if you were to sign an offer sheet next summer, the Hawks could have the opportunity to match that. We'll cover that if we need to. I won't go through all the details on that right now, but basically he'd be a free agent, but be, would be restricted next summer if the Hawks do not find an extension. As far as the extension is concerned, though, most of the time, these kind of deals go all the way to the deadline or close to it. It's sort of the non-max players. Occasionally, you'll get a deal done earlier. Like R.J. Barrett's deal got done a couple months ago now, almost, uh, around the around the talk, talks about him and Donovan Mitchell, etc. And, you know, the max guys got done right away. But, like, for example, last year, Kevin Herter, had his deal go all the way to October 18th. That was like right on the eve of the deadline to get to actually get done. And generally speaking, most of them are in that range. You know, there, there are a few exceptions like Kelton Johnson, et cetera, but for the most part, you expect these deals to get to kind of get done closer to the deadline. So if you're rooting for the extension as a Hawks fan, no need to panic just yet. Obviously, there's still plenty of time for it to get done. I would still guess though, and I would say it's an educated guess, but not, not, a, not I'm not like reporting this. I would certainly estimate that it would not happen if you made me choose. Because from what I have heard, what was reported by Jake Fisher earlier in the summer, the Hawks and Hunter are not super close to a deal from what I have sort of put together. And again, it's kind of a perfect storm situation. I've said this before on the show, but basically there are two sides to this. Hunter is a, top, a former top five pick. Obviously his skill set is incredibly valuable as a six, eight, two way wing. If it all comes together. So his side justifiably is asking for a lot of money right now. And they, and they should, I mean, if he has a good year this year, Hunter is going to be a hundred million dollar player or something like that. Like that's with the, with the cap exploding with his appeal as a two way wing. Like there's a lot to like there. If you are Hunter on the team side though, there is reason to not be excited about that right now because he's had all the injuries. He's had these struggles for the big part of last year, the rebounding issues, all that fun stuff. Like if you want to be skeptical on Hunter, you definitely can be. You look at the numbers and the production and the injuries. Or if you want to be optimistic on Hunter, and you definitely can be, you can look at the flashes and the fact that he is, you know, that very coveted 6'8", two-way forward. So there's a lot of reason to think that these, these, these sides might not be super close right now. And from the team side, the only way that I would do this, this is more of a philosophy thing for me, would be if I was getting a deal that I thought was a pretty good discount at this point because the Hawks still have the hammer of having match rights next summer. So we'll have more on this if it gets close, if there's more reporting on this in the next you know three weeks between now and the extension deadline. But for now, I think that uh, all eyes are on that. That's probably one of the bigger situations to monitor along with Bogdanovich's injury and anything else that's going on for, for the Hawks right now in, in training camp. But Hunter's not a guy who's going to talk a lot about it. Obviously, he's a pretty mild-mannered guy in general with the media. So we probably won't have a ton of like reporting on this until it gets closer or if it actually gets done. But I can assure you we'll talk about this again when the deadline is nearing in October. 
Okay, more questions to come. Uh, we still have one, one or two more after this break. But first, a word from our sponsors on the show. Today's show is brought to you by Bet Online, and football is here in a big way. In fact, as I'm recording this podcast, I am currently keeping an eye on an NFL game as we speak. And Bet Online is the number one source for all of your pro and football teams right now across the sports world and especially this season. Find all the latest developments in the football world. That includes game matchups and news and podcasts at Bet Online, and they have all the cuts that you need for your weekend slate in college and pro football. Bet Online is a continuing source for all the wager information you're looking for as well across the board. That includes live betting and esports. And live scores, but online is also the fastest and easiest way to consume every sport you might be interested in at this point. And on this show, we talk about the NBA extensively, of course. There are plenty of future bets available for you right now. That includes win totals and conference odds and division odds, title odds, individual award odds, and much more. And beyond the NBA, but online has odds and lines on college sports and baseball, MMA, boxing, golf, tennis, auto racing. Horse racing, soccer, entertainment bets, and much more. Head to Battle Line right now on your mobile device or your computer to learn more about all the trends and the action across the sports world. Bet Online, where the game starts. All right, and a question from Jack who says After listening to the Point Guard Preview podcast, I was wondering what would happen if Trey Young missed time with an injury. We've seen what would happen if Murray was out from, from past years, but what do you think the rotation would look like if Trey was out now that Murray is on the team? So it's a good question from Jack. Um, hopefully that will not happen. Obviously, we're all rooting for that to not, not be the case. Trey has been very durable in his career, by the way. That's one of the things I like about Trey is that he is always looking to play. He is not someone who shies away from that. He wants to play 82 if they'll let him play 82, and the Hawks do obviously need him. But this year they are best set up in his career for any time like he might roll an ankle or something like that. Um, before I answer the Trey part, by the way, Jack did mention that we've kind of seen the Hawks without Murray because he's not on the team before, but they don't have a ton of depth now without John Tim Murray. That's uh, that's always worth notable uh, if he were to be uh, missing some time. Even if they have Trey, their wing situation isn't quite as durable as it has been in the past in terms of like options. They would start bogey if he was healthy and be, and be totally fine there next to Trey, but the backup guys are not terribly sexy if that were to happen. So if they were to miss you know, Murray, they would, they don't have a Kevin Herter laying around. They don't have a DeLon Wright laying around even. So that's worth, no, that's worth noting at this stage. But back to the question, if you assume everyone else is healthy and just Trey is out, I think the Hawks obviously would start DeJounte at point guard full-time. He'd be back in the role that he was in in San Antonio. In a lot of ways, it's a pretty natural fit for him. And then to have Bogey as a starting shooting guard. That's a pretty good backcourt. Obviously, not quite as good as Trey and Murray, but that's a backcourt that I would say is probably above average in the NBA. Murray's a really good player, obviously, an all-star last year. Bogey's a really good player. That's a nice luxury to have when you have – you just say, all right, now you're all NBA point guards out. The fact that they could somehow put out a – backcourt that was actually probably above average is pretty impressive behind that though they would almost obviously have to use Aaron Holiday as a backup point guard anytime Murray was off the floor and because of that I would probably recommend staggering bogey because you want to have a little bit more ball handling and creation help for Aaron Holiday not his strength necessarily I do like Aaron Holiday he's not the most on ball creative guy and uh, because of that limitation as an offensive engine, having Bogey out there would be useful. I'm not sure who would get more minutes. It's like kind of the fourth wing because you ha- obviously would have Murray not being a wing anymore. He'd almost play all his, he'd probably play all his minutes at the point without Trey. You'd have some combination of Tyrese Martin or AJ Griffin or Trent Forrest even or Jared Culver even. There's there are options there in terms of being in the mix for some playing time. I think you'd see a lot of Justin Holiday. In that, in that instance, you'd obviously have, have him be your third wing behind Bogey and Hunter. He'd play a lot of minutes in, the, in, those, in those scenarios. Again, we're all rooting for Trey not to be uh, missing time because uh, he is the lifeblood of this of this roster still, even with Murray on the team. And again, they are better set up now than they've ever been for a Trey injury or for Trey foul trouble or Trey just to kind of have, needing rest, et cetera. But they still need Trey. It's one of those things where it's very obvious that they do still need their best player and that that's the case. So the Hawks would not be the same team without Trey for any length of time, but that is part of the appeal of the Murray trade is to have a little bit of insurance, both when Trey is off the floor during the game and if he misses like a two you know, two weeks or whatever. I do think the second unit offense would be very rough if Trey were to miss time because that would be kind of what's been the case for a long time where they wouldn't have Murray. They would have that kind of backup rudderless offensive unit without Trey, but Alas, that is the uh, hopefully that sort of answers the question, and we'll all knock on wood in the meantime. Okay, and from there, we'll have more mailbag questions. I've, I've, I've actually have a pretty good stockpile right now, which I definitely appreciate that we definitely want more of those. We're back in this four or five episode per week thing right now, and without a ton of game content, I'll be doing more mailbags than, uh, than usual still as the season is sort of ramping up at this stage. But 
This will be the last piece of media, media day content that I actually share in full like this. But after I put out the Trey Young and DeJounte Murray videos recently on the podcast, a few people asked me if there were more. And John Collins is sort of high on the list of guys who went pretty long at media day. And John's always entertaining and sort of he'll give you a real answer to questions in a way that a lot of guys don't, don't necessarily do that. So some good context here and uh, some good stuff that people were asking sort of for more of these uh, these full videos for some context as well. So there's about 11 minutes of audio slash video from Collins at the end of the podcast. And this is where I will stop talking for today's show. But before I do that, thank you for listening to the podcast. Please, please, please subscribe to the podcast. Tell a friend or two or three about the show, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, etc. Please leave ratings and reviews wherever you'll get your podcasts, especially Spotify. And Apple, follow the show on Twitter at Lots on Hawks. Follow me on Twitter at BT Roll. And a quick break here from our sponsors. You will hear John Collins addressing the media at Media Day and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. We'll have more podcast content coming this week. So stay tuned for all of that. Happy birthday. Um, Lauren, I'm Lauren Williams Thank from you. the AJC. I'm just curious, as you went into these open runs, what impressed you most about how your teammates came back from the offseason? Uh, you know, I, I felt like m more of anything, they were um, focused on the, the IQ, right, learning the game. Um, you know, I feel like everybody here is talented, but um, it takes a level of understanding mentally, right, to mm -hmm. be able to use your gifts um, in, the, in the correct fashion. So mm -hmm. I feel like more than anything, guys are trying to apply themselves and, and learn the game and learn the teammates' tendencies and uh, just you know, trying to play with, within the flow of the game a little bit more, and uh, I like it. And, and how do you navigate being on a team and your name kind of consistently being in trade rumors? How do you kind of stay professional and, and do what's still expected of you? Uh, I mean, I just do. You know, I mean, there's nothing, you know, that, you know, really forces me or drives me to besides uh, just trying to, trying to stay true to myself. You know, I mean, I'm not a person that comes in and that lets what's happening in my world affect you know, somebody else's world, especially when we have to all come in together, right, as a facility. And, you know, if I want to be looked at as a leader and all that good stuff, you know what I mean? I can't, I can't let, you know, whatever's going on in my life affect, affect everybody. So uh, I just try to think about it as not being selfish and, um, you know, just handle what I got to handle. Uh, John, uh, second what she said as far as happy birthday goes. Uh, I appreciate looking that. Looking forward to a great season from you. What have you been working on uh, throughout this off season? As she mentioned, we did see you in the summer, summer, summer games and such. Uh, every year since you've been a Hawk, we've seen something in your game improve, whether it's your three points, uh, shots, or things of that nature. So, what have you worked on this summer, and what are you looking to improve on? Uh, you know, always just, you know, first and foremost, just looking over, overall, be a better player, be smarter, as I talked about, uh, be a better leader, be a better teammate. But um, skill wise, I've been just trying to work on, you know, my ball handling, um, my shot selection in terms of getting to my spot, right, and, and shooting the shots that I'm comfortable with, as well as just being able to create. Um, a myriad of options to get to my spots, right? You know, not over um, complicating the game, trying to simplify it through uh, just understanding my game more, right? And, and, and tightening up a couple screws and bolts. So uh, I, I just say creation, right? Or my ability to create um, for myself and for others, um, as well as my ability to play off the ball. So, uh, you know, I'm working on everything. And then uh, if I could just follow up quickly, off the court, of course, you're uh, becoming known in the world of fashion. Uh, with the Baptists and such, could you give us any updates on what you may have coming this fall or any new apparel that you're working on? Yeah, um, definitely been an all summer thing uh, for me with, you know, my team and um, just trying to work on, you know, growing myself um, personally through my brand and, uh, you know, expressing myself through my clothing. So uh, you're definitely going to see a lot of more creative ideas. Uh, hopefully, you know, I can have some more success, a lot more success on the court. You know, that always helps uh, whatever I'm doing off the court. So, uh, just going to try to keep positive energy for that and um, just try to stay focused. Hey, John. Uh, happy birthday again. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Uh, just wondering, how are you feeling health-wise, um, your finger, of course, and then um, anything else that you've been dealing with? And also, what was it like playing with DeJounte and Trey in different program games? And um, what was it like going to Seattle and playing there and meeting up with Jamal Crawford and all of that? Yeah, I mean, uh, so my finger, my foot, uh, they're both doing well, you know, uh, foot, I definitely feel like has uh, healed completely. You know, I mean, the plantar fascia just a matter of you know trying to take care of my take care of myself. You know, maintenance and um, say being consistent, right, with uh, just taking care of my body, my finger. Excuse me. Um, my finger. Uh, obviously, I feel like you know it's not going to be, be be too pretty. 
Um, but uh, in terms of its functionality and, and my ability to use it for basketball, it hasn't you know, affected me in any way. So just blessed that I can still play basketball with uh, you know, you know, illness that I do have. But uh, not, again, not taking away from anything I can do. So confident in that as well. So it's been a great, it's a good summer. And uh, in terms of playing with DJ and Trey, that's always, you know, good good to go out there with Trey. You know, I feel like with Trey, it's, you know, you know, like riding a bike. But with DJ, it was always, um, you know, going out there to see him and, you know, put ourselves in his city, his hometown, right, to go out there and meet Jamal. We just wanted to uh, put the, our, our best foot forward for DJ and try to welcome him to the team, welcome him to the A in any way we could. And, why not go to his city, right? Go to his side of town and just try to, you know, embrace him that way. So it was great. And I definitely, you know, we put on a little show. So that was always uh, good to do too, right? Get, get that chemistry started early. Hey, John, um, hope all is well. Coach talked about, um, speaking of the trade talk, Coach talked about the talk that you all had and as far as that and what he dealt with when he was going through it. But how does that make you feel knowing the fact that your coach got your back like that, you know, to take time to really talk to you about that and um, let you know that, you know, you still a hawk and you want it? You know, uh, I knew coach had my back before, but to hear him, you know, uh, say it again and continue to say it and to continue to just be a person I can come talk to, or, you know, he pulled me into the locker room to have a conversation. You know, I, it means a lot to me that, uh, that he's thinking about me. But if there's any one person in that organization I feel like understands, you know, per my perspective when it comes to that is coach, right? Being a coach for, you know, however many years he's been coached. Now I don't want to talk about it too bad. Uh, but, you know, he, he's seen a lot, you know what I mean? So I, I trust that he, he knows exactly what I'm going through. And uh, it's just good that I can confide in him, you know what I mean? It's cutthroat business. So um, just always good to have some reassurance from coach for sure. Not a basketball question, but 25 years young, JC. If you could pick one Old. piece of advice that you've gotten now through 25 years of life, what would it be that's kind of, you know, stuck with you? Uh, you know, outside of, uh, you know, my mom just, you know, trying to keep what she instilled in me in terms of my uh, my character, right, just being myself, trying to just be authentically myself, that's, that's one. And then I feel like the next part about it is, you know, she always told me, you know, right, positive, you know, keep a positive mind to, to aspire for more positive things, right? We can't ask for positive thinking negative or feeling negative. And then I'd say the last one is, you know, to, to not really try too hard, but to have the intent, right, to have the mentality, to know what you want, uh, but to not, you know, force yourself on anything, right? You sort of try to let it happen with the mentality and the intent, right, and, and the, uh, you know, approach that you already have it and that you want it. So, as I said, you know, not trying too hard, but still trying just enough. And I feel like finding that balance for me is uh, a big piece of advice that I always keep in myself is just to, to go with the flow and to uh, follow my first mind, even though I won't always be right. right? It's, it's a learning experience. So i um, try to flow it, flow it, let's say go with the flow. How do you feel heading to Abu Dhabi? And how do you feel it's going to help team chemistry just being out there for so long? Uh, yeah, you know, uh, I'm not too excited about that 16 hour plane ride. Uh, but, you know, it's definitely a once-in-a-lifetime experience for sure. Going out to Abu Dhabi, you know, I don't know if I would ever really go there for any reason. So, obviously, like I said, not, you know, a place that I would have thought I was going, but uh, an experience that I'm um, happy to, to take, take a journey on with my teammates and, and to bond with them early in the season. I know that will help us uh, gain a, some chemistry just being someplace different uh, together. So, I'm hoping it all, all comes together in a way that we all hope to do, uh, it works you know, to work out. Problem. When you get a new pick and roll partner, another pick and roll partner, what do you expect to go through in, in camp and in the preseason with DeJounte to kind of get your timing and communication on the same page on, in the in the pick and roll? Um, you know, I, I mean, to be honest, the, the first thing that we're going to get is, you know, a lot of mess ups, right? You know, we're, we're not going to be perfect, right? We got to find the chemistry, right? You know, same thing with Trey, although we felt it chemistry, right, and we knew we had a, a feel for each other. You know, other guys understand that we have a feel for each other, too, and aren't just going to let us, you know, just go out there and do our thing. So it all comes to fine-tuning, right, getting into the practice gym and running a million pick and rolls until, you know, he knows where I like to catch the ball and I know how he likes to roll for him, you know, all that type of stuff. You know, we, we, we build on and we, and we eventually just 
naturally let happen, as I said before. So it's trying to do it and also letting it happen and trying to just uh, let it build into what it could be and just stay confident, stay positive. John, have you given any advice to Trey about having a newborn? And if so, can you can you give up one that you get given him? I mean, the, the first the first uh, piece of advice that I just gave him was, man, you, you know, you got to be on. You know, you you never really gonna be off. You know, you come for practice. You know, Trey's Trey. You know, I'm mean, going around where he's outside, where there's media day, and then you got to go home to you know he he's married uh, as a, as a lady at home has a, a little one now, so. You never really can turn it off, you know what I mean? You always, you know, you being outside, outside your Trey Young and at home your dad now, you know what I mean? So it's always more responsibility than you are, you think you have, but it's something that he'll get used to. Um, it, you know, I always feel like having, you know, son or daughter makes you better, makes you hone in on being a better person, right? You're trying to show that next generation, your next generation, what you want, you know, what you, how you want them to act and how you want them to continue on their legacy. So. Again, it takes some time, but, you know, he's always got to be on. John, what have you learned more about DeJounte being a teammate now, especially, like, on the court working with him? And is there anything that's kind of impressed you now that you're that close to him instead of just watching him in San Antonio? Yeah, I always – excuse me. I always knew he was a, a – you know, say it this way, but he always had that dog in him. You know, a dog mentality. He's, he's – you know, he wants to win. He's not scared of anybody, you know, and I could see that. You know, we even had a couple of interactions on the court against each other when we played. I'll let you guys go, you know, look at those. But um, if that shows you anything about what, you know, what's in here, um, I can feel it now in, in the way he speaks. You know what I mean? He's, uh, he's a damn good dude, and uh, I'm, just, I'm happy to have him on, on my team. I'm happy that he plays the way he does. He's just a hooper, you know what I mean? Doesn't try to do too much, goes out there and flows and plays his game. Uh, and then, to me, right now, one of the best defensive players in the NBA, leading the league in steals. Um, so, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm happy to have DJ on the squad. Um, and I'm happy that he's, he's even more genuine, you know what I mean, than I would have thought not knowing him. So, again, happy that he's here. Thank you, JC. Thank you. I appreciate it.